Hey folks, and welcome to the Daily Ratings Podcast. It's a show where each week we sit down with Vincent Daly to get his thoughts on the latest movies he's been watching, both older films and new releases. And don't worry, there's no spoilers. Vince will give a brief review of the movie, share some thoughts, and of course, then rate the film. The Daily Ratings are always fair, honest, and most importantly, they're consistent. On today's show, Vince will be rating and reviewing... Broadway Melody of 1940, directed by Norman Torog, In Full Bloom, directed by Reza Gassemi and Adam Villasenor, Mass by Fran Kranz, and newly released The Curse, directed by Sean Ellis, and Uncharted, directed by Ruben Fleischer. So stay tuned and enjoy the show. Mr. Vincent Daly, how we doing, buddy? Hey, Thomas Riker, how's it going? It's going super good. It's going super good. How was your uh, week of movies, man? A week was good. We are closing out February, so uh, looking forward to speaking about these movies. Looking forward to speaking about the last Fred movie, of course. Oh, of uh, course. Yeah, so. yeah. Big, big Fred kick. Yeah, big Fred. We, as we close the book, the chapter of uh, uh, Fred, Astaire Fred Astaire February. February. <laughs> <laughs> the, the inaugural. <laughs> yeah, but I, I love it, though. I think we should start there, as we always do, the earliest film here. So let's do Broadway Melody of 1940. Yes, uh, our final Fred film for the month, uh, February. Uh, and uh, honestly, some interesting timing with this because there has been some rumor mill uh, of Tom Holland apparently playing him in a biopic. Oh, uh, I don't know of if... All people. Uh, yeah, I don't know if the search algorithm, the SEO on me is is plagued by Fred Astaire for <laughs> how many <laughs> movies I've been watching. But yeah, uh, interesting. I think... So young I'll, guys now, it's Tom Holland and Timothy Chalamet. That's yes, it. That, that, that's, 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 that's all what we're Hollywood plucking has. from. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I will remain. I will hold back any kind of judgment of that until we until we have uh, some more some more definitive yeah, look to what just, he's doing. We can yeah. we can bash on Tom Holland. <laughs> Plenty later. <laughs> right, right. And exactly a couple of movies later. So. <laughs> Interesting history with, with this one. Uh, this is a film series that I had no idea about. Uh, uh, there is a Broadway melody in 1929, another in 1936, another in 1938. And now this is in 1940. Zero story connection, though. And same director and such? Uh, I don't think same director. Oh, okay. All MGM uh, and all a MGM brand to cast musicals at the time. Okay. So no, nothing specific poor director and nothing specific for Fred Astaire. Yes. Being from, attached to. From what I researched, no continuing characters either. But Eleanor Powell is in nearly all of these. And she must have either been on contract with MGM at the time, which... A lot of actors worked in that way. They mm-hmm. were kind of right, owned right. by the studio for their productions. Uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, no connection, though. And that, that kind of preface is definitely to... Yeah, I was thinking I was going to have to watch all these. <laughs> and really happy I, I didn't because, uh, I mean, while uh, Broadway Melody of 1940 is good, these are very by-the-book musicals. And, and even... Even there's some standout sequences, and of course we'll get into that. I think I've I've had my fill of Fred uh, and 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 oh, kind no. of old old type of movies at least for now, at least for now. So okay, um, real quick. So this is 1940, mm-hmm. and I know you said in the past, like you know he's a, he's was really around in the in the early earlier days. Mm-hmm. Is 1940? Is he like? Starting to, is this one of his later movies? Uh, no, as far no. As time this frame is goes, or? this is definitely him coming off of his career with Ginger Rogers, okay, uh, and, and that being the the famous pairing uh, of 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 his movies. Uh, I would say this is one of the first he branches out with, uh, and I believe 
I could be wrong. I think there is one that she, he he separated from Ginger Rogers, but this is, I think, probably the higher profile of the two that he is finally switching up his dancing partner to Eleanor Powell. Right. In this okay. Case. So uh, the story consists of. Um, Basically struggling entertainer partners, Fred Astaire and George Murphy. Uh, they're both trying to crack into Broadway. The musical that they, you know, uh, get some traction with is led by Eleanor Powell. And I, I got to be honest, out of the three names there, I was most impressed with her. I think this is the theme hmm. for all four movies we covered this month, that the female lead is the standout of yeah. the two. Uh, you uh, like Bing Crosby a lot last week. That is true. Yeah, that yeah. is true. But the, the the shocking thing is is like you had all these other people step a little bit a step above Fred Astaire. Exactly. Uh, and, and definitely When it comes not to steps, boy. not really, but <laughs> as far as the characters go in the film is what it seems like. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and for me that that was that was surprising, but definitely a pleasant surprise. Eleanor seems to be the connecting thread here uh because like I said she was in the two previous films. Uh, but she gives even Fred a run for his money as far as being a powerhouse dancer on screen. Oh, yeah. She has some serious skill. I would say if there's anything leading me into uh, some desire to check out the previous works, it's that Powell's filmography is pretty much just these musicals with MGM. And That's it, really? Like, yeah. Huh. I mean, th- I'm sure there's, there's, there's a few other, but sure. that was the main thing that I found in, in some of my research here. So... Uh, just impressive. Uh, her sequences are stand out. She's enjoyable to watch, and, and like I said, really give Fred uh, gives Fred a run for his money as far as folk, folk work on screen and how much screen time she does get to dedicate towards dances. Uh, okay. Once again, I think what defines this this decade or two decades of Fred Astaire movies after his his starting uh, of of his career. It's it's probably him taking more of a back seat and less being in the center focal point. He's always sharing the uh, the spotlight so in some way. Proper fifty fifty, would you say? Yeah, uh, I would or say like maybe even the thirds it. because obviously oh, wow. okay. uh, we have a the, the ongoing relationship between him and George Murphy as entertaining partners and uh, kind of a drama playing out from that. Mm-hmm. Um, the film is slow going is at first. Uh, it's finally at. About an hour in, we get some solid Fred Astaire dance sequences, but to this movie's credit, uh, from there, it is rapid fire, uh, and the dance numbers are one after another, and and really, I think if I had my way, I would have liked them dispersed a little bit more throughout the film, Okay, but it really was you know jam-packed towards the end. My favorite number, as always, are the solo dances with Fred, uh, as I... We talked about with Easter Parade, I think his imagination is on display in the choreography. Uh, the song, I've Got My Eyes On You, holds that slot in this film. And he, he, he winds up dancing with a, uh, a cutout uh, of Eleanor. And uh, just, just very creative, uh, definitely sparks that excitement that we see in numbers that Fred did in The Royal Wedding, which is one of my favorite films from him, mm-hmm, uh, and mm-hmm. how creative the numbers can be. What, what I like hearing, you know, we've talked to, we've had a Fred kind of, sp- like, years ago when we first started the Daily Ratings, mm-hmm. you and I just sitting down as a pet project. Mm-hmm. Back then with Fred, and still now going through it week after week, I love that he re, not that he reinvents it, but he keeps it fresh in a certain way where you're not right. sitting there and you're just like, okay, Fred, what are we going to pick up this time and dance mm. with? Like, you know what I mean? Right. You can see how it could get old and just be like, really, same old shit. Yeah, what's the, what's the problem? Same old stick, Fred, really. <laughs> But that's cool. Like, okay, he grabs a cutout and yep. it works. Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. There's, uh, and, and uh, like I said, I mean, I think it's it's imagination uh, on display, and and luckily when when he gets uh, some more time to shine in these films, that's shining through. I still think, uh, unfortunately, the films that we covered this month, uh, he's not in the forefront, so that's not the focal point. It's almost uh, cherry on top. Uh, with these movies then. So uh, a very solid movie, though, I think largely for the chemistry of Eleanor and Fred and what they have on screen. Like I said, it is a definite slow start. I think the relationship between the characters as entertaining partners is 
very beat for beat, very by the books. I, I mean, obviously, I have to kind of cut it some slack because it is literally 1940 on the dot. So, you know, maybe screenwriting, you know, wasn't the most developed as, uh, far, as far as dynamics. Okay, but, all right. Uh, but There's yeah, some standouts I, back then, though. So yeah, you could point yeah. to for sure. I think I think uh, audiences probably at the time were happy for that. What I am happy in the present day uh, with this movie, though, is after that hour or so, uh, it, it is not only jam packed, but the quality of the dancing is is amped up quite a bit. And again, the chemistry between Eleanor and Fred are, are is really top notch. I would honestly rank this much higher if it wasn't so back loaded. But maybe a bit more balanced out. That makes but sense. With that a little said, heavy on the third act. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and maybe that's the nature of it. Uh, the production of a musical. The you know what's kind of going through everything and and building up there. But honestly, I mean, I I cannot deny that the later half of this film is is dynamite. Mm. I just and and you know really the main the main focal point of my critique here is that I think it would only rank higher if it was just a little bit more balanced. That's not saying it's bad whatsoever. Sure. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and give Broadway Melody of 1940 a 71. Ooh, that's a pretty good score. Pretty Absolutely. good Fred score. Absolutely. Hmm. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think the highest ranking of this month. I think you're right. I mean, Holiday Inn, I mean, it's not getting a really good score right. out of 43 <laughs> right. from last week. I kind of <laughs> tore into it. <laughs> but yeah, Funny Face got a 70, uh, so this just notched it out there. Yep, yep. <clears throat> but very cool. Wow, seven, yeah, 71's a very good, uh, very good score. Okay, and then uh, this is our last film. We're closing the book, correct? For, for, uh, we for are February. closing the. It is done, so <laughs> I won't. I won't. I won't touch another dance number until next February. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what you say now. That's yeah, right, <laughs> right. Um, until Sony mainlines the Fred Astaire biopic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's move on here. A film I don't know anything about. The film poster looks really cool, though. Mm, yes, but okay. it does. So this is in full bloom. It came out in 2019. So a big jump in years here. And what is in full bloom? What do we have here? Yeah, honestly, I was trying to go back. I have a, I must say, you know, a colossal list of movies that I have. Uh, some areas are labeled uh, of who maybe recommended me them or, you know, like we covered a couple of weeks ago with Soylent Green, uh, how thematically they're tied to when I want to watch them. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, full in Full Bloom was on a random list, and I, I can't tell you, uh, I am so, so happy I watched this film because this film turned out to be phenomenal. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, this is a tale of two boxers post World War II. Okay, and a stylized, almost noir story. It's not detectives, of course, but it has noir vibes, both for the time period, but also how the story is presented. Characters are larger than life. I try not to use terms like that because I, I don't know if I had to even define what larger than life is. You know, right, I mean, right, it's yeah. it's kind of really big. Yeah, it, really it's big. it's it, for me. It feels like the characters themselves. They're given solo time to act, to convey their character, to almost uh, bandstand or soapbox um, uh, of what their character is supposed to be, and that's what I mean by larger than life. Uh, on one side, we have Japanese champion played by Yusuke. Ooh, I should have cleared this before. <laughs> Going it looks like Yusu uh, Yusuke Yusu Agasawara. I think it's Yusei uh, Agasawara. No. Yusuke? No, yeah, I think it's Yusuke. Yusuke. No, I think it's Yusuke. <laughs> <laughs> I watch a lot of anime, so. Oh, damn it. All right, got me on that one. Uh, the last name, though, Ogasawara. I think. Uh, and Ogasawara. Ogasawara. Uh, and the other played <laughs> by the American champion, played by Tyler Wood. A much easier name, but... You got that one. <laughs> also, also the weaker performance, so... <laughs> but honestly, both were a standout for me nonetheless, because they are both first-time uh, actors. And to no surprise, then, this is also the first feature for this directing pair as well. And oh, cool. I can't tell you, folks... I am very excited to see what comes out of this directing duo because this was a wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, I think... Oh, very cool. This is a little hidden gem we have here. Absolutely hidden gem. Yeah. Um, cracking into it, the film is set up towards building towards in the th third act. 
the title match between these two champions. The setting behind it, like I said, this is post-World War II, so there are extremely high tensions between an American boxer and a Japanese boxer, uh, and kind of the press being held in Japan in this story. Uh, on the east side, uh, this is structured as a training tale hmm. between a rising star and a veteran boxer play, uh, you know, this this veteran boxer almost has kind of Mr. Miyagi vibes, <laughs> you know, there's plenty of uh, wisdom and kind of unconventional training mm, that okay. happens here has a lot of heart to it, and that's what kind of reminds me of a kind of a Karate Kid or even a Rocky Four. So I was going to ask, what where does this place with Rockies? Like it, any resemblance or not really? No, I, I don't think so. so um, what about Rocky Four? That's, that's uh, well, Rocky point. Four more so the the aesthetics of training in the snow, kind of unconventional training. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, being a theme in that, uh, and that's definitely the theme here on the training of the of the Japanese boxer that he is a champion already at the at the time period or or the spotlight that we have on him in the film uh, in addition to that, he's looking to take it to the next level because the American champion, played by Tyler Wood, uh, you know, he is a powerhouse. He outclasses him in weight class. Nonetheless, okay. we're still entertaining gotcha. this matchup. He has to get over him somehow. On the West, of course, on the American side, we have a champion boxer on the decline in his career. And what was probably the most interesting is that He's dealing with a lot of trauma where there's a uh, comedy and inspiration on the Japanese side of this. There is melancholy, uh, uh, dealing with trauma, and also suspense on the American side as our American champion is also in a very bad spot with this decline as he is taking more riskier deals mm. and this being Japanese uh, boxing at the time crosses paths with the Yakuza, the Japanese mafia. Oh, uh, Which cool. is, creates, I mean, definitely adds to the noir piece that I, I kind of described earlier. Sure. Really creates some good tension because both sides are so enjoyable to watch uh, play out in parallel for the first and the second act of the movie. But on top of that, there is both sides are, are equally strong. They're they're strong in different ways. And I think the the ability for the for the movie to juggle both of these, it's it's refreshing. It keeps you engaged. I would say maybe the script isn't the strongest, uh, and, and that probably plays out here the most because really the the the, the conclusion of the film is just building up to this fight, mm -hmm. this this right. title ship, uh, this title match. But uh, I, I really want to give credit to. I mean, obviously, it's not juggling a huge amount of things. It's just simply a, a plot A, plot B, but really enjoyable for very different reasons. And uh, who oh. knows? Maybe that plays into why there were two directors. I, I don't know. This directing duo, it's, it's their first feature. So. And they wrote it, too, together. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, really enjoyable, though. I, I would say the standout for me, this is a extremely good-looking film. Mm. You, you noted right from the poster, and I think maybe that's what landed this on my random list of movies is I saw this striking Yeah, poster. I mean, maybe it came out in 2019. Maybe as soon as it came out, it just it hit a list for you or something yeah, like that. Yeah. You, know, you saw uh, it and just were just like, okay, let's put that in the... Exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I mean, I definitely like the concept uh, or, or the plot of the story, this kind of uh, East versus West post-World War II. I think that's pretty engaging. But the look of this film is absolutely the highlight. If I have to give this a, a single praise, it is not for anything else but... Wow, is this just striking from start to finish? Uh, there are really, really just excellent shots, very creative cinematography, mm. and especially by the time that we actually get into what the film is about, which is the boxing match itself, uh, it, it really it, it drives forward such a. I, I mean, I I like things like ra movies like Raging Bull. I will enjoy uh, boxing and, and fighting type of movies in general, but the type of creative cinematography to break the mold that we see on display here in the film is really top-notch. Uh, just a huge highlight for me. I would say a, a critique is maybe not the most complex story in script. You know, I, I can honestly 
forgive it for how excessively good looking this film is. That's which awesome. I, I think the visual storytelling maybe steps in for some a slim script, you know. Okay. Uh, it's just not, you know, dialogue isn't the focus. Right, it's, right. it's training and fighting that is the focus. So, uh, but uh, this type of film and the visual storytelling that is on display, and, and I, I would say the success it has in crafting a feeling, I, I would say, man, this 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 has some simplicity that reminded me of Whiplash, uh, that it's just a wonderfully executed film. It's music to my ears. I mean, how many times have I brought up Whiplash just because when you're oh, talking about sure. a, you know, basic script or something like that, and a basic script doesn't necessarily mean bad, yeah. but if in order to be mm-hmm. really, really good, there needs to, it needs to just have a certain feel, a look, and it needs to come together really well. Whiplash exactly. has that super basic, super... <laughs> you can't get much more basic than that, yeah, really. Yeah, exactly. Um, even like production-wise, it's like pretty cheap, mm-hmm. but boy, mm-hmm. it's, when it's executed to the nines, it's, it just makes such a good piece that Absolutely. much better. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's cool that we kind of have, have that. And yeah, and, and this, this captures that in, in, in just the look, the feel of this film. Um, you know, the flavor of it was was right up my alley. A solid recommend for me, though, uh, as, as when we finally build to that single match, like I said, uh, it is a amazing dazzle of creative cinematography and beautiful slow motion shots. I would say if there is a reason to watch this or maybe have this carve a spot alongside the greats of any kind of boxing movie or or maybe even just not not the greats but your favorite boxing movie it is the combination of new type of shots being used within the ring and then just really beautiful slow mo shots which i'm ah. sure will be more used as the technology and more high fidelity camera work is becoming more common. Uh, not that slow motion shots or or, or hyper uh, hyper slow motion in in you know high fidelity cameras that that's uncommon. But I think the specific combination of the creative shots and when we le- or when the rather the directors lean on those slow motion shots, it really is a perfect example of a movie that is right on the clip of a must-watch for me. Wow. We're going to go ahead and give In Full Bloom an 80 on the dot. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. Out of nowhere. Yeah, seriously out of nowhere, which is sometimes the best. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. you know, I don't know what it is about boxing movies. I mean, like, I mean, Raging Bull, mm-hmm. the Rockies, of course, you have this, you have... The, the Fighter. The Fighter. Is that the Mickey Rourke one? Yep. With South Oh, wait, no, no, no. Uh, What is the Mickey That's Rourke That's what I'm one? saying. There's the Mickey Rourke oh, one with the... Oh, that's The Wrestler. And... <laughs> yes, yes. Mark Wahlberg was in. Uh, uh, the fighter is, uh, is Christian Wahlberg, Bale too? and Mark Wahlberg, yes. Gotcha, okay. The wrestler you're thinking of, Mickey, Mickey Rourke. Rourke. okay. Yeah. And then I think the, was it Jake Similar Gil- in tone, actually. Jake, I know, that's why I get it mixed up. And mm. Jake Gyllenhaal was in like South Paul or something? Oh, yes. Is that yeah, good? Yeah. People, I, think people I don't know. I don't, I've never saw that, We'll actually. return to it a little bit. That'd be, and, you know, it'd be an interesting compilation to put on the site, actually. Just boxing. Boxing I, films. I, I, oddly enough, I think my attention would be there to, to watch a bunch of it because... Well, I just don't think there's that many, mm-hmm. and it seems like the ones that people know are like extremely good. I mean, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe not all the Rockies, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A uh, real quote on the uh, just because we spent a lot of time with the cinematographer and the art, sure, and sure. Like that. It's weird they don't really bill a cinematographer; they just have art direction and then mm. the supervisor, art director, mm. Mercedes Younger, um, also worked in the art department for The Room. Wow, two thousand three. Wait, wait, the, the ro- <laughs> yes, not. <laughs> The one we just reviewed, yes. Wow. The... Interesting. So yeah, very it's, interesting, it's... Uh, and also interesting how it all ties. It's the yeah. right people who kept their jobs on that yeah. one. <laughs> the right people were able to climb the ladder, right to better things. That's <laughs> for sure. To better things, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, eighty uh, in full bloom. So definitely, people should check that out. Yes, definitely uh, going in that should watch category. Ju- just big visually time. stunning. Uh, something that is a, a visual feast, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I I was just very pleased with it. For not only, I mean, it is a first time feature film director for the this du- duo. Yeah, duo director, duo writer. But yeah. packed with first-time actors, too. Is, it was refreshing, is the word. Yeah, that's awesome. That, that, that's really good, actually. Uh, definitely a highlight of this episode, I think. Mm-hmm. But let's keep it going here. So our next movie is came out in 2021, and it's Mass, directed by Frank Krantz. Ooh, okay. Uh, this is a, a doozy of a film. My review of this, folks, is going to be a, a, a tiny bit light because the the subject matter of what this movie is about 
is very much the movie. Uh, mm, this is one of these. Uh, yeah, yeah. This this is actor turned first time director and writer Fran. Uh, oh yeah, Franz Kranz, mm-hmm. uh, and with a very slim budget, slapping some actors in a room and having them act their pants off, <laughs> uh, and it's some really top performances. Not necessarily no name direct, uh, no name actors in this, but a- an interesting combination of four. We have a few recognizable actors, and I'll get into their performances, but I would say this is a very, very emotionally heavy film, uh, as Mass pits two couples in a room to hash out their connection to a very tragic event that both of them experienced, or or both of the couples experienced. Um, I would say, like I said, uh, and a little bit before, the best part is actually trying to puzzle together what the hell happened. Uh, and the film does a amazing job. Uh, I mean, Fran does an amazing job uh, in the in in writing this script at creating almost a a grim game of your you're watching these actors perform. Your imagination's running wild on what could be the event itself, and slowly information is dripped to the audience to try to piece it together. I can't stress enough, the most enjoyable part is puzzling this together for yourself, and that's where I really don't want to, I mean, more than the most, uh, I don't want to focus on any kind of spoilers with this, because this is, one, it's, it's about the performances, which will speak for themselves, but, I mean, realistically, the plot can very much be summed up in one sentence, but the the joy of this film and the expertise or the expertise in what Fran did with the with the script and his directing is again what is specifically not told, what is specifically left to imagination, and we almost never get a one hundred percent straight answer as to what this oh, is. Oh, okay. So yeah, something um, like this where it's like like you said, kind of lower budget, and it's so it's focused in like a one room, correct? Basically, yeah, one room. Yeah. I mean, to keep your attention there, the writing has to be solid, mm-hmm. and it needs to be executed really well by the actors. Exactly. Too. Exactly. And the, and this film keeps the actual event at arm's length not only are our two couples dealing with the you know the aftermath of this event some odd years later it it really does create a great hook to the dialogue that constantly keeps you piecing it together Mm. i would say probably more than a handful i would say probably a good seven times i was pretty certain what the event was and they kept on again dripping new information in the dialogue in reactions very subtle reactions okay very cool uh, and uh i mean yeah really stellar for that reason so was the pacing good were you finding yourself it's about an hour and 50 minutes long so for almost for a movie for this you would think mm. like you know maybe it's just should be a 90 minute or something like it's that. a tough question because it's kind of emotionally draining after a while. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, the characters are emotionally drained with the subject matter of, <laughs> and just hashing this out in this small room. But I think that unfortunately does translate a little bit to the attention span uh, that someone would have with mm-hmm. this film, myself included. Uh, it wasn't that I wasn't interested. It was just that it was it was emotionally heavy and taxing for that reason. Sure. Does that make sense? Uh, of course, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there's uh, there's... Oddly enough, some, I don't know if I would call it blocking, but uh, some very interesting visual design once again in how our actors are set up. It's a simple room, and you could say, well, realistically, how many, you know, what what can you do uh, with How many a options do you work? have there? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a standout because basically it's set up in a four square uh, designed around kind of messy feelings in every direction the four square can go uh, and we have the actors pairing off mm-hmm. side by mm-hmm. side with interacting with each other so where in the, the first parts of the films it's wife to wife it's uh, it's husband to husband we see kind of a match back and forth we see kind of sides turning and and and, and conflict between the couples themselves and, and within their relationship and it's interesting because uh, I would say, once again, you hear that premise of it's four actors in a single room for the entire runtime of the film, or, or nearly all of it. 
there there is some enjoyment to seeing how these actors are pairing off almost workshop style and it's really and, and, cool. and unpacking each other uh, with uh, with their acting. It's so. amazing when there's so little you have. You have a room and four people in a room. Mm-hmm. You know how just important all of a sudden that camera works be- becomes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's very, uh, it's cool to see that it's kept it uh, kept you engaged for yeah. sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So uh, I I think all of this is in this tight box and and even if you maybe don't see how I'm seeing it of this this visual four square to to the storytelling going on on screen it is definitely uh, I mean as sad as, it, as sad as it sounds it's like this box of grieving and it, it's it's very emotionally heavy but it's also very good for that reason yeah of course so the standout out of the phone uh, out of out of the phone out of the four is Anne Dowd uh, and a total snub for the Oscars this year oh you think uh, huh I don't she was yeah. that good. I, we had some I, snubs, though. We did have some snubs. Well, first snubs. of all, it's the Oscars, so I, I, low, but. Yeah, Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, I think, honestly, my number one snub, just because not nominated and definitely not winning, is... Uh, uh, Gaga. Uh, no, no. Not, Gaga. not Lady Gaga? <laughs> From Macbeth. Uh, I'm forgetting her name. Catherine... Catherine, the, the, who played the witches. Uh, oh, yes. You yes. loved her. Phenomenal. Yeah. You Phenomenal. said she was barely in it, though, really. She was barely in it, but still, that supporting, that could be there. Yeah. And Doubt is, is absolutely another snub. I think her performance here of a man, uh, it, it is raw, uh, but it's also so relatable. Man, I, 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 she feels real. Yeah, they is, all yeah, feel real. Yeah. She feels like, wow, real. The realist. <laughs> yeah, the realist. <laughs> Uh, and and I think the reason why Anne is the standout of the four is she's just able to juggle so many layers. There's a sequence in the film that uh, the two husbands are talking, and her Anne's husband, who is in like House of Cards and whatnot, I forget the actor's name. Uh, Reed Bernie. Yes, as Richard. Yes. Yep. Uh, he says something, and she gives such a subtle like tinge of a reaction almost yeah. like like how it would really happen in right, a relationship right. it told so much it, it told so much and what she was able to do to unpack that but also not really ever directly address it in the film i mean i can't tell you i mean it was a standout the wow, the type cool, of juggling cool. of layers uh right. to the character was was amazing and that really is there for all the characters but I mean, it would be too much to unpack each of their uh, performances. And honestly, it's one of those things that I don't want to, much like the plot itself uh, or or the storyline itself, uh, I don't want to give too much details to it because it, it's something that I'm definitely coming in warm with a recommendation. And you should you should watch it for yourself then if you if you're interested as far as the subject matter of what we're talking about and and definitely the format of what we're talking about. Yeah, here, it so. would be interesting just to watch a film so simple, mm. ex- you know, and how it's executed executed at a good level. Mm-hmm. You know, just for that reason, be interested to watch it for filmmaking. You know, absolutely. And and, and maybe you know, it's sparking something. Maybe this got ignored by the Oscars because of how low budget it was. I don't know if they yeah, who have, know how much- still have criteria around like you know it needs to be in so many. Theaters and yada I don't yada. know. I, it's very. I don't know because independent films have been so massive lately in the Oscars. Yeah. But uh, it, it's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, uh, I think my main hit to this film is the fact that this is the screenplay and the screenplay alone. Like I said, there is creative visual storytelling in how our actors pair off. I wouldn't necessarily call it creative cinematography for that reason. Uh, it's just more so. I mm, like okay. how. These these almost one or ones are being created within the four people in the room. Okay, gotcha. Sure. Um, editing as well, pretty straightforward, but not really marks uh, uh, against it. I think it's just it didn't more hurt, so. Yeah, you're not saying it hurt it at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this could very well be a perfect example of a film that is excessively good, uh, excessively good acting, but does not make the hurdle of saying uh, of me saying. Hey, this this is a has to be a movie. A a film has to be right, the medium right. for this story. This very well could have a uh, you know a theater or you know uh, live in person run to this. Uh, oh, it sounds like right for, perfect for for a play. Exactly. But if you're getting those moments in the room, you know, again, if you're the fourth person in the room, that cameraman basically, mm-hmm. if you're the camera and it's really affecting things a little bit, mm-hmm. it sounds like it did have purpose to be on film. Yeah, uh, and I think. Uh, 
as far as a critique, that is just more so kind of explaining where I would not crack this into a must watch, but this gotcha. is absolutely a, a very solid movie and, you know, for a late February film of me watching, uh, was emotionally <laughs> <And the blues. laughs> was emotionally devastating, and uh, <laughs> but oh, thank God you made it to the mic today. Oh man, <laughs> yeah. dragging myself. No, uh, entirely joking. But uh, there, there is, there is uh, uh, so much enjoyment in the premise of. There are grievances that these two groups of characters have with each other, the four total grievances with each other, and the room is for grieving, and the actual subject matter is never fully, fully addressed. We're always just puzzling that together, and I think it's just such a sharp script. We're going to go ahead and give Mass a 77. Oh, 77, a great score. Great, great score. score. Great movie. Yeah. I thought maybe he was going to crack into the 80s, you know? And, that, and that's where I think, again, I, I don't feel it is... Film is the perfect medium for it. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but, but again, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of more of a half step than anything. It's it's just in my mind, that's what kind of prevents it from being up there. That's by no means much how anything in the 70s. I would not describe it as bad. There's just maybe opportunity for it. Okay. So. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it'd be interesting to hear afterwards and after filming this. You know, how, how, what the effect on the actors was. Sure. Yeah. You know, if they if it took that a, a toll for them, you, th- you think about like Daniel Day Lewis after Phantom Thread that said he was done from acting because oh, it sent him into right, deep depression. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just little things to think about. Absolutely. But seventy-seven, great score. Again, I'm interested to. I, I just like those more quiet films. It, I, simplicity and done mm-hmm. well. I, I don't know. I'm driven, I'm driven towards that a little bit. So yeah, yeah. definitely a check out for sure. Mm-hmm. Very good, Finn. Okay. All right, folks. Well, those were our three previously released films. And you know what's coming up next. We're going to have our two now playing in theaters now films. But before we have that, of course, we're going to go into our producer segment, ladies and gentlemen. So this is the part of the podcast where... We roll out the red carpet for all you producers who help make the show possible here. You know, where Vin and I sit down and we host the show. So many of you help produce the show. And how you do that is it's your monetary donation. You can go to thedailyratings.com, head to the donations tab, and you can donate whatever amount of value that you feel you received from us. It's a value for value model. Basically what that states is it's, it's just that. You know, are you checking out the site, going to... Listening to the podcast. Are going, you getting, you know, a, a rating element? You know, is is this guiding you in, in, in your watch list? Absolutely, yeah. You're just, you, are you just hanging out with us? You're listening to the podcast and using the site? And, you know, we don't really want corporate sponsors or anything like that. We don't want to deal with that. We don't want to flood you with ads on the site to bog mm-hmm. it down and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, we're creating something here. And we're also, what we're also doing is creating open dialogue with you. So when you donate, you can write in a note. If you want to be anonymous, just go ahead and say so. But otherwise, you know, you send in a note with your donation and we read it on air. And that's what we do here in our producer segment. So today we just want to give a shout out to our one sole producer today, but it's Jerry Duke. And we want to say thank you to Jerry Duke. She donated $100. Wow. Which is fantastic. Oh, man. Um, And she wrote a little note here and she just said, awesome. Way to go, guys. Oh, thank you. (laughs) We definitely appreciate it. And uh, folks, I want some hate mail, Jerry. That's right. <laughs> Give us something more yeah, than that. Uh, there's got to be a movie on the site that you don't agree with my rating with. <laughs> <laughs> But the cool thing is here, we can open up dialogue with you all. It doesn't have to be a short line like that, you know, and uh, you can give us, yeah, you can hate on us as, if you want, or you can give <laughs> yeah, us tips or comments that. or ideas and, and discuss things that, uh, you know, further the discussion along. This is a direct through line to you. And again, this takes time, a lot of time, and it takes a little bit of money as well to make this all happen. So any support you give to all of us, we so, so much appreciate. So we thank you, Jerry, for giving $100. And by the way, she's one-fifth of the way there become a director. Wow. When you donate five Five hundred dollars through any donation amount, through any period of time, any number of donations, you can become a director, and there's some perks that you know you get with that as well. But you can check out the site for all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. But again, all right, folks. So that's the producer segment. We thank you so much for all of you who want to become a producer. DailyRatings.com donation tab, and we'll stop pitching that, and we'll move on. Uh, this is when we are going to go into our now playing films. And I think what we'll do here, Vin, we're going to start with The Cursed. Mm. Uh, and this is directed by Sean Ellis. And uh, what do we have here? Yeah, so uh, I'm always looking for the uh, spooky movie with style. Uh, 
And yes, this, you this, are. Yeah. This this kind of hit a note for me because uh, obviously this movie is probably going to get lost in the shuffle at the uh, box office very quickly. Uh, I think it's even technically competing with some other other horror films that I, I think are going to probably squash it. But I, I, I think this is worth your time. It was it was definitely an above average watch for me. Uh, the Cursed is an early 1900s horror movie. I feel like a lot is focusing on kind of turn of the century as of late. You know, uh, 20s, 30s, 40s is out. 80s are out. Now everyone's going to the 1900s, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a story around a gypsy curse that is put upon a land that unleashes an evil for years to come. Sounds maybe a bit generic, but uh, I really did enjoy the style and the flavor of this film. Uh, The beginning is not too scary, but it's kept alive with some really, really brutal violence and gore on screen and really just well shot. I would say between this... In a good way. In a very good way. (laughs) I would say between this and In Full Bloom, I mean, uh, I, I I was happy with the eye candy i was happy with the with the moving pictures on screen and and i think uh the the scene i or the sequence i want to talk about it's really not a spoiler because it's more so in the setup of how this this gypsy curse is put upon the land there is a shot of frontiersmen or, or or um uh, I don't know if I would call, say, for frontiersmen, but uh, basically the conflict between this gypsy camp and the landowners, uh, you know, basically wanting to kick them out. It is presented in a single wide shot, not a single cut, and goes wow. from, I mean, a thriving camp of gypsies to a complete destroyed remains i mean it it is a wonderful wonderful sequence how it's presented i I, it's it's so much of a highlight it almost shot this film in the foot because it was like so good i was waiting for more (laughs) oneers you know one shots um but conceptually wow i i mean that if i was on set with that uh on that day that they shot that i i they should be very proud of themselves. Very cool, uh, very intense. And like I said, though the maybe first quarter of this film, I would not call a horror. You know, it's not spooky, jump scare horror. Right, right. The brutality, the violence, it, it sets a foreboding within the film that is it is really top notch. Um, but when we get into cool. it, this is a stylized old-timey monster film and focused primarily on the hunter Boyd Holbrook uh, who was yeah I like him as an actor yes yeah. yes I liked him in Logan I thought it was yep. very cool and he's very cool in this as well uh, investigating how this horror was brought about there were almost uh, I mean it feels both in style and obviously for the reality that this is turn of the century it feels like a turn of the century style of uh, investigation in the monster, very Bram Stoker, uh, very almost Lovecraftian uh, in in how it is uh, this this almost scientist uh, using his tool to hunt more effectively, mm-hmm. uh, and it was very enjoyable because it it obviously entirely fictional, but felt almost like period piece horror and, and very well executed for that reason. I would say. Unfortunately, all, all the confidence that this movie has in the beginning quarter of the establishing of, of this story, uh, it kind of goes out the window. The confidence, I don't know where it goes. Uh, the jump scares <laughs> are very overused in this movie uh, and come up very predictably. And, and honestly, it, it, I think what's what I'm disappointed in is it's it's really unneeded. The suspense in this movie is driven by its violence and the promise of violence that we see. How graphic it is in the first opening sequence! I think that is enough to drive engagement uh, with the audience, and not these cheap jump scares that. Honestly, like I said, very predictable and almost makes me question in testing of this film if they had to add those for test screening and and, and test audiences Hmm. that they weren't engaged enough. I was there for what it was originally going for. It feels like the film kind of flips on its side. They trapped you. 
Yeah, they, yeah. They got, the, they got the hook in you in the beginning. They got the hook in me yeah. with something unique, something brutal, and then kind of more so becomes generic, and it's really tied into these jump scares. Uh, okay. Not saying jump scares can't be used effectively. We touched on the Night House not too long ago, back in October, and sure, that sure. had some jump scares that... I did critique it for being out of place, but not necessarily bad. Once again, it's it's the predictability of it, you know, the the build up, the the silent to the string hit, you know, it's 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 very typical. Yeah, it's a little been there, done that. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, as as much as the beginning of this film is a high, I have to give another pretty big jab at this film. It has pretty rough CGI, which is I would say rare in this day and age. Uh, I would say CGI has kind of leveled out in a way that almost everything is at least passable. This, of course, probably. Kind of, to an extent. You t- I don't know. You know me and CGI. Yeah, that is true. We don't that, go hand in hand. That is, that is uh, your nitpick for sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, Was it supposed to be like, was it pulling from like old school stuff and no. trying to have a vibe? Oh, it was just I, I wish there was practical effects. Uh, there are some practical effects and monster work in the design of certain areas. And when it's there, guess what? It's phenomenal. Hmm. Like they clearly oh, know what right? they're doing uh, as far as the design here. But yeah, it's when the CG is on display. It just uh, they gave they gave certain things like a motion blur. It looks like, and I, I don't know why that was the reason. But the it's it, it's a shame because the practical effects in the gore are so good. So clearly they have a team that is putting right. in serious work. Uh, you know, for this movie. It just feels like, unfortunately, when the CGI is mused, and, and obviously that, that ramps up for the conclusion of the film, it is really bad. It's straight up Damn, bad. Damn, that sucks. Yeah, it, it's it's a shame because I was so I was so hot on this film leading up to it, uh, but it it's just it does not look good. And and for you know someone like you, Tom, mm-hmm. that. It would it would ruin the movie. For yes, me. it really would, and, and that's a damn shame uh, because I think there's there's a lot of love put into this story to craft a a stylized time appropriate horror and a unique story too. You know, this is a, this is an original story, so I want to give props for that. Sure, it's funny. So this the movie. Some of you might know it as um, the original actual movie title was Eight for Silver. Oh, that was the name of the movie, and it was for, it was in Sundance last mm. last year. Oh, so they renamed it, and apparently for the theatrical release, they changed the name to The Cursed, mm-hmm. and the director even took out CGI, more CGI. Oh, wow, there was more in it previously for the, for the Sundance release. Wow, and for the theatrical, they apparently the director just quick reading, you know, yeah, good the, research. The uh, the director actually took some CGI out. Mm. Wow. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that also explains, uh, uh, folks at home, we were kind of racking our head over the, the how this film is presented for its release. Some places say Very 2021. S- Obviously, I saw this in theaters. Yeah, and definitely, yeah, so if you see on the daily ratings then for the site, you know, we're going to have just the U.S. main release mm-hmm. for 2021. Exactly. For 2022, so, yeah. But that's interesting. I mean, probably, thank God, then, if it was bad enough that he re-edited things for kind <laughs> of were walking a- out. <laughs> 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 Only for a select few. <laughs> Only for a select few. But yeah, I, I would say uh, again the not only is the CGI fidelity bad, I would say where I really have to kind of take my knives out on this one is, man, uh, it, it's the the monster work in areas where it's practical, where the gore is a real big highlight because that's the same gore work that was used in the first establishing pieces of this of this story um it, the the CGI work on the other hand is complete 180 it i feel it's uninspired uh it's that bad yeah uh both in design and and, and like i said with the with the actual fidelity of what's going on so <laughs> yeah, it looked just look bad. <laughs> yeah, it just yeah, it just bad about all around, which is a real shame because I mean if this is going to Boil down to a monster movie. I gotta, you know, I gotta be real with, uh, with what's going on there. Uh, again, I, w- I was very about what was set up. The brutality, uh, the flavor of the horror was right up my alley. I like what was going there, and 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 very investigative horror. Like I said, Lovecraftian kind of comes to mind for uh, how much problem solving is is, is put out there. 
but doesn't quite stick the landing for some technical reasons. Uh, I would say it's oozing style, but may not be something that uh, that that survives the test of time. We're going to go ahead and give The Cursed a 61. Mm, 61. Okay, all right. It was probably a high 60s. You, you take that those opening sequences. Uh, yeah, and just carry the coolness throughout the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it definitely had me interested in rooting for it, but... Uh, CGI I, brought it down a decent amount. And, and just and the jump scares, the cheapness of it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and I have to be practical. Is If this is described, self-described as a monster flick, you know, a revival even of a kind of a typical, you know, mm-hmm. very old-timey monster sure. flick. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. If the monster isn't <laughs> <laughs> that great, then... <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, what can you say? Yeah, what can you say? What can you well, say? 61, that's what you can say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For the cursed. Yeah. Okay, very good, Vin. So we're going to move on here. We have one more, folks. This is the big blockbuster here this week. <laughs> Get ready. This is... A tinge of... of <laughs> this is... Of the, hate in yes, your voice. Uh, the great Tom Holland, the Wonderkind, <laughs> and Mark Wahlberg in Uncharted. Uh, uh, Vin, what do we have? Okay, all what right. What is this movie? All right, so this is uh, our big time Sony release. Uh, this, of course, had the PlayStation Studios uh, splash art in the beginning. Um, kind of got me excited, especially when I'm, when seeing like God of War and whatnot. Of course, Last of Us is, I believe, in production right now with HBO. Mm, okay. uh, so. There, there's some I bet promise. They do a good job with that too. It's very um, HBO e material. Oh, for Last sure. Last of Us, yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and especially where the, you know the series goes with it's emotionally heavy. For what it's worth, uh, I would say this is probably the closest we've gotten to the film matching the game. I, I will say the bar set pretty damn low though. Uh, in a world with Resident Evils and Mortal Kombat's not matching <laughs> the game whatsoever. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and what did we talk about a couple weeks ago? Super Mario Bros. Exactly. It doesn't even match the the game even remotely. Right. <laughs> so, you know, we, maybe we are uh, on the, the better part of the grading curve uh, when it comes to these video games movies matching the video games themselves. Don't get me wrong, casting decisions like Mark Wahlberg still make no sense uh, to what the actual game is, but we are at least dealing with a framework that closely resembles the game, or at least I think the closest we've had yet uh, in, in, in video game movies, which just are... are cursed uh from <laughs> cursed from the get-go for those unfamiliar the uncharted uncharted follows nate drake tom holland in this uh, as a soon-to-be treasure hunter a serious passion for history both equally around legends and his own family tom i think well uh, tom holland not, mm-hmm. not, tom, not tom across the table uh, which is a joke i have written down multiple times in my notes uh, <laughs> I think Tom's doing a decent job here. I know I know we're disagreeing on this, uh, Mr. Wrecker, but <laughs> uh, I think um, I didn't mind him at all. I think the highlight is his physical per- performance. I think it it captures the feel of maybe not Nate Drake. Uh, this is kind of Tom Holland's Nate Drake, which is it, it, there is a distinction there. And maybe that was intentional by Sony Pictures. But I feel it, it, it's in Tom's performances and, and almost nowhere else in this movie that we at least get a glimpse at the scrambling action of the Uncharted games. I think probably a ongoing dialogue we'll have on the show with video game movies is, I mean, who really gets the credit for sequences? The video game itself or the movie? If it's playing beat for beat, I don't know who really, you know, what's the value of, of of just rehashing things in live action, especially when it's all CGI to begin with. You know, it's it's basically a video game anyway. I think where it does succeed is again more so in the feel, in the element uh, of scrambling action that uh, that happens in the game. I think the standout, if I have to give an example of this, is the thug fight in the auction house. I think it captures a lot of sequences that play out in the game that uh, really uh, bounce Nate Drake in a creative way that he's having to work to get over on someone that he has no right, you know, even surviving in a fight. So I think that the, the one auction house sequence was the standout here. 
This film has a uh, sizable supporting cast, though. Most notably Marky Mark at, as Nate's partner, Sully. Um, <laughs> I uh, I have written down here, obviously, but I, I'm almost questioning that now, kind of digesting the film a little bit more. Um, I, I, you know, this this is a obviously an origin story for this partnership. I, I don't know if it has to be that, actually, now kind of thinking about uh, I think it. That's but, fa- no, I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah, I guess because the vast majority of people... They they need to get up to speed on this, you know. They're, they you know I don't think I don't think there's there's definitely a a audience base for who played the game, who's a fan of Sony IP and property, and going to see these type of movies. I think for how big blockbuster this film is shooting for, it needs to be that origin for for everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I found uh, this dynamic between Tom and Marky Mark uh, to almost never work on screen, uh, and that's putting it lightly. <laughs> I, I would say almost every single shot that Mark is in is weaker. Because of his inclusion, uh, their dynamic back and forth is just far too bitchy for my liking. <laughs> uh, there's there's almost no joy in in their dynamic, and 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 I I want to I want to give two sides sides of criticism here. One. I don't think it works from an enjoyment point completely detached from Uncharted uh, because, again, the the sequences that Mark is throwing in quips and very Marvel type of writing and dialogue to, uh, it really just comes off as annoying and detracts from either the suspense or uh, the, the drama that's going on screen. Uh, and then, like I said, down to the casting, down to the root, it is rotten as far as the casting is concerned with Mark's performance because he's, you know, on the video game side, he's not, he doesn't look like Sully, he doesn't sound like Sully, he's <laughs> nothing to do with the character, nothing, I mean, I mean that, nothing to do with the character. <laughs> so... Take a take a take a rest there. Does that make sense, Tom? You've been quiet. You've been stewing, stew tomato. <laughs> <laughs> He's collecting his thoughts. I, 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 I have a feeling I'm gonna be putting no, no, on no, some no, shoes or taking off some <laughs> shoes. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, everything you're saying is making sense. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. I mean, you get what I, I'm saying, though. Like, absolutely. I think he, wor- he uh, Mark's performance here doesn't work entirely it detached be noted. from it, it the, sh- the Uncharted right. games. It, it should be noted because we were following this a little bit more. There's a lot of people that don't know or care about what Uncharted is. Exactly. It's like, what's the movie? Mm-hmm. But know that Sully is a gray-haired, kind of older guy, raspy voice. Mm-hmm. A father figure. Where in well, this, he's uh, a, a he's, crusty, hmm. weird, backwards father figure. Sure, but the fact sure. is, like, older, gray hair, raspy voice, always has a cigar in his mouth. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's been around the block, he's supposed mm-hmm. to feel. And I get it's the origin story. So we're going to a younger Nate Drake. We're going to a younger Soli. It doesn't feel... It doesn't feel at all like the character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't feel at all like the character. And, and that's where I bring up, I, I think, um, I, again... Uh, my critique of his performance really is, uh, I, I, I don't think it works entirely detached from Uncharted as a property. Because even if I walked into that and it, with, with my thoughts of Marky Mark, uh, you know, was seeing Uncharted regardless, and I didn't, I didn't know Uncharted at all, I, I still would describe him as annoying, detracting from the screen uh, or, or from the story. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I mean, I, I don't mean to use you know uh, to to boil it down maybe to to language i don't normally use but they they are bitchy you know that that is that is the <laughs> dynamic it's 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 not enjoyable to watch uh and i feel like it's a it's a wannabe marvel with a little bit of edge uh, maybe that's par for the course with sony pictures you know they do make venom uh. and whatnot and I actually well, the te- director I did Venom. <laughs> the director did Venom too, which we're not fans of. Yeah, yes, in yeah. The slightest. Right, right. Oh, well, Venom as well. Uh, Venom two, I think, was someone. Uh, Venom Carnage, the, the the second one, was someone else. Unless that was him yeah, as no, well. No, 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 correct. He, he yeah. did the first Venom. Yeah, which is just like you made Tom Hardy terrible. I don't understand. How you yeah, do that, but yeah. Anyway, anyway it's another show. But uh, uh, this is big money action adventure, uh, and I would say naturally, this movie is all about the set pieces. Unfortunately, as with everything, trailers completely blow those set pieces uh, away, and uh, there's there's really no surprise to 
the scale uh, of what's going on. I would say some of these follow the game to a T. And it, like I said, it brings up that concept. If we are going to have the same CGI sequence, almost beat for beat, uh, in video game and movie, who gets credit? This is unlike a novel. In a novel adaptation, there is an entire visual design that is in the hands of the production team to give life to the words that are normally in between the pages. With a video game, it's CGI already. Yeah, there's the medium that you're playing in, and I would say in this story that definitely works a lot better, but what's disappointing is that the the sequences that work are on t- entirely on lease from the game, and right, the sequences right. that don't work are nonsensical and have nothing to do in the game because clearly they're they're not thought out. <laughs> clearly they, they, they have not been put... Uh, and created with passion that the original game writers and, and game designers had for this story. Uh, and and again, I, though we're talking a lot about the original game, folks at home, if you have not picked up a controller in your life, again, my critique here is that this is not working both on a film level, but also what does work is on lease to the, to the game to begin with. So I really don't think yep. there's... There, there's there's much here to give kind of a unique credit or a, a feather in the cap, as I refer to sometimes, uh, for uh, for the for the production here. Overall, though, this film feels less like Indiana Jones, which was of course the original inspiration for Uncharted, mm-hmm. and more like a national treasure in structure. Maybe not a terrible thing if you like National Treasure as more of a modern adventure film, uh, but. Uh, I, you know, I think while the investigative work is there, I like it, but quickly that is slimmed down to rush to set pieces, spoiled already in the trailer. And on that note, uh, I think a lot falls apart in the third act as characters just show up in places and, you know, it just feels rushed, weak, and, and inconsequential. Uh, yeah, certainly yeah. a passable film, and I will remain optimistic for these Sony properties, as I really do love these stories, as I love Uncharted story, all four of the games. But uh, I, I think there's 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 too much that is on lease here and definitely not enough to keep me hooked uh, for the film succeeding on its own merits. We're going to go ahead and give Uncharted a 45. 45? Ooh, doesn't, it doesn't cross the yeah, passable yeah. 50% kind of. We, we, were, uh, we were talking right after the theater, folks, and... Uh, yeah, I, I was on the edge because there's, there's obviously razzle dazzle with all these. But, mm, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but speaking of, uh, <laughs> of talking what, are you after expecting the theater, something? Are, you expecting are you something? not going to give a Tommy Two Shoes? Okay, so I have a Tommy Two Shoes <laughs> score. I have a Tommy Two Shoes score. Tom is a massive fan of so Uncharted, yeah, I'll try to be and a, he has good taste because Uncharted is amazing. I'll game. try to be as quick as possible. So yes. basically, I, I'm not a video game guy. I know very little. I, I play very little video games mm-hmm. throughout my life. I'm not a video game guy. I did always. I, I liked. I loved Uncharted. Mm-hmm. Still do. It's just a game I would sit down and play. Sure. I absolutely love it. Okay, so for those of you who don't care, like <laughs> Vint hit it right on the head. Actually, it's a little bit of Indiana Indiana Jones versus meets National Treasure, mm-hmm. with like maybe a little bit of like uh, definitely a Tomb Raider or even weird Pirates of the Caribbean type theming oh, once in a while. Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. And the thing is, the games are so incredible. The games very much, you know, it's it's four games, mm-hmm. and increasingly as you go through the games you know not only are the stories getting more involved or anything like that but it's starting to look more and more like a movie mm. and these games are so good that the content is there for you and if you want to do an origin story which i think is a good way to put it yeah that's i love it that's fine sure. make a new story don't pull directly from the game <laughs> that's fine and they pull it's just like okay good they failed miserably at it first of all <laughs> They failed they really miserably. Did. I mean, I walked down and said, this is the most generic movie I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I was t- talking to you, Vin, mm-hmm. and it was like, you know, it felt, just felt generic, treasure hunter type of thing. And I was like, you know, you don't really have many. You have Indiana Jones, mm. National Treasure, and then like, I, that's all I have. Kind of Tomb Raider. And so it's like, it's generic where there's not even much to be generic about. Absolutely. Yeah, it it's, it's really doesn't have a peer right now in <sighs> the film landscape. So could have knocked it out of the park for that reason. Uninteresting, uninspired, and boring. <laughs> I mean, bo- the movie is an hour and 56 minutes, and it's two hours too long. 
I was very upset with it. I was so <laughs> sad. Me, me. I was a huge Uncharted fan. Can't get enough of content. Right, and right. I did. I legitimately checked my watch a couple times sitting next to you. Yeah. I actually was it's trying to check my watch. It's an action film. How, how can, you know, that, that's a failure. Of and I was also film. just like sad too, so that part of it. It's boring story. And, and okay, a big part of the game is problem solving, puzzle solving, climbing is a big part of the game. We have no cool climbing. Oh, it's true. It's true. It's just like that kind of stuff. The, the puzzles that were solved were dumb. The map with the keys looked ridiculous. <laughs> I hated that part. The supporting cast, fine. Antonio Banderas, I thought it was going to be cooler. I thought it was going to be better. Just when he gets good, it's just like whatever. Yeah. And then Tom Holland, I, he totally, when you look at him, he's just like, oh, he's like playing Nate Drake. That's not a bad Nate Drake. And yet I hated seeing him as Nate Drake. <laughs> I, I hated seeing him as Nate Drake. To the other it's point, a Tom feud. I almost enjoyed <laughs> seeing Mark Wahlberg more on screen. Really? Because he was so... He was so not Sully. I okay. was just watching a different character. Okay. I was yeah. watching Mark Wahlberg more from like the nice guys with sure. Will Ferrell. Yeah. He was just like he had the same attitude. He went about things almost mm-hmm. the same way. And it's just like, oh, this is just Mark Wahlberg in a character. It's not Sully at all. Again, mm. I understand we have young Sully, so we're not gonna have an old gray haired guy. Mm. But it's there don't give me normal Wal- Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> Maybe he did research or not. But oh, how I, it shows is Mark Wahlberg never heard of the games. Yeah. Mark Wahlberg never played the games. No one sat down Mark Wahlberg and said, here's what Uncharted is. Yeah. I don't, it does seem like that. Again, we were following this for years. Mark Wahlberg was kind of slated to play Nate Drake mm-hmm. before they decided to go with the younger Nate Drake. And it's mm-hmm. almost like contract. I, it's almost like he called up Sony and he was like, am I in this movie? I was hearing rumors I was in this movie. And then Sony was just like, what do we do? It's Mark Wahlberg. All right, I guess we'll put him in. Why don't we just right, make him right. Sully? Yeah, it yeah. was one of those moves. So I almost like seeing him on screen because it was such a joke in the first place. <laughs> I thought the fight scenes <laughs> were not that great. You know, that, that is probably the most I was watching a different movie. character. Um, they took some of the biggest set pieces from – it's not like it's from – you know, game one in this first movie, they mm. took a bunch of big sets from like, you know, multiple, mul- multiple games. Mm-hmm. And when in the game, you're ed- on the edge of your seat, making sure you click the right buttons at exactly the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise known as stakes. I felt like there was no <laughs> stakes in the movie at all. It was boringly done. I mean, I told Vin for the same, I mean, a huge budget to this movie. It's Sony. Oh, big, massive. massive budget. You have Tom Holland. Cause of course, let's just put him in things. You're right. Uh, I would have <laughs> rather see Timmy. I would have rather see Timmy Chalamet in this one. Really? I don't care at this point. I mean, Tom Holland, he was so bothersome to me. So bothersome. <laughs> Scorched so, Earth so the on biggest... this review. <laughs> Scorched Earth, it's just, folks. It was just like, oh, my God. And you're right. He had mannerisms of Nate Drake. Even yeah. the weird thing was some of like the pointing, the hand pointing, mm. when a hand was on screen and pointing towards things or on a map, mm. it looked very much like the video game. Like, Interesting. Was, I don't even know if they thought about it like oh, that. Yeah, yeah. But again, big movie, big money. Mm. I told Vin, all they needed... Give a, like again, the game has basic writing, mm-hmm. and it still works. The yeah. writing didn't need that much more work in the film. It mm-hmm. needed maybe a little bit, a uh, little bit more attention to detail with the writing. Sure. I would say considerably detail in the plot. Manage mm-hmm. the plot better. Give us a better damn origin story. Mm-hmm. But overall, not terrible. Actually, they could have yeah. made it good. We want a better fight scene. Give me a good fight coordinator. Give me a good director. Mm. Um, and put one fan of the game in the room. Like, if you have <laughs> one fan in, in the room of the film, and it could have been so much better. But again, uh, uh, a fight coordinator would have been huge, or a stunt coordinator. You're right. And then uh, better better directing, better cinematography, and the film actually could have been something special. Yeah. It would be a massive, same amount of money used in the process, mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. massive jump from the most generic thing I've ever seen. <laughs> to something special that's different, something yes. that's actually different that fits yes. in and this maybe thing. stands apart from the game and, as and, well. And we can use that. People do like National Treasure that has a certain yeah. spot, but like mm-hmm. Pirates of the Caribbean started something, and I, I do feel like this was something that could have. There is a hole still to be filled. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that is. If it's a Tomb Raider hole or a whatever, but yeah. there's yeah. A, a, a subgenre to this category that this could have fit and, and been special mm-hmm. and been thought about actually from years to come. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just they ruined it at all costs when they had some of the best games ever yeah anyway that's coming from a fan from a movie perspective if you're going to the movies vin score makes complete sense right uh right. you'll walk out not caring about the movie i think you'll mm-hmm. it, you'll be like all right that was one of those you'll movies. forget it in a week yeah it's it's the the, the shots that should have been cool weren't even cool and mm-hmm. you'll forget about it in a week <laughs> 
you'll be getting into the car and be like, <laughs> you what wish was you could the forget name? <laughs> what was the name of the movie we just saw? It's going to be one of those things. Mark Wahlberg kind of select amnesia. If you like seeing Mark Wahlberg and if you like the nice guys with Will Ferrell, uh, the other guys, the other guys. Oh, yes. Sorry. Oh, the nice guys. Oh, the nice my gosh. guys is uh, uh, yeah. Uh, That's right. The other Shane guys Black. with Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> You're going to like Mark Wahlberg in this. Just yeah. treat him like that character. Tom Holland. He's okay. Whatever. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, no climbing in the movie. I thought the fighting <laughs> wasn't good. Uh, again, oh my See, god! But that's a Even good the point tr- with the climbing. Where were the guns? Where was Tom Holland? <laughs> Did Tom Holland ever pick up a gun? There's so much shooting in Uncharted. It could have been so it's cool. Some true. of the set pieces. It's true. <sighs> this movie is so, <laughs> was so disappointing. Sony, you've destroyed. It was fan. so di- and you've it was destroyed. so disappointing. <laughs> so sad. So bad. Um, uh, What's the rating? I want to let me just end it. I want to see. <laughs> I want to see more films. I do want to see more Uncharted right. films because I love Uncharted. Uh, if, it, if I didn't care about the games, this would be this would be a straight up zero shoes on the t- on, on the zero, Tommy two shoes. Foot. I'm giving it one shoe untied. The only reason why is because I can't give anything t- uh, zero shoes when it's uh, attached to a chart Uncharted. Mm, true. I true. still have, and it is a functional movie. You know, what I mean, it's a dumb blockbuster, but you know, generic. But it is a you know. It was god awful. One shoe, which I would say is Untied. worse than. Untied. <laughs> Untied. I would say is worse than no shoes because you have this like off balance. No, too. <laughs> no shoes is bad. No, oh, okay. no shoes at the bottom of the barrel. When all right, these all things. right. Ma- I won't mess with you. But <laughs> basically, you're grading <laughs> right. But Matrix Four. No shoes. This gets one shoe oh, untied. Okay. Laces. Laces aren't. I like on that this distinction. I like because it. it's just like you. I. I, I mean, you for. Uh, Again, I'm all I'm full of piss and vinegar on this one. Yes, and normal viewer, just to be safe, you'll walk out of it and being like, "All right, that was like okay, right. but it wasn't that good." Matrix, mm-hmm. I think most people would have been upset mm. with the money spent on the on the ticket. Very true. <sighs> okay, what was that? Eight minutes? I spent. <laughs> That's as quick as I could have made it. <laughs> That's good. No, I haven't thought about it I, since much. Somebody uh, called me and asked me about it, and I didn't even have words to do bl- it. You blacked out. I you, didn't. You, yeah, you, <laughs> you had amnesia. Uh, Listen, I, I, I think you, so. We're on the you, same page. Yeah, we absolutely are on the same page, especially around the generic elements. But I, I think you bring up honestly a great point with with Sully. I mean, what did I praise Super Mario Brothers? It was unique. Uh, maybe they should have leaned in more unique. But I, I don't know. You know, I, it's. I feel the curse of video games is not going away. This would. And this, it's not the video. Not yeah, it's not the video games. It's just people don't want to put in the right writers. And, mm, and the right sure. producers and things like that don't get behind it. And that's all it is. It's just fanfare. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. It's the opposite of fanfare. It's just like, you know, let's get some big boom. Let's pump it out. The yeah. audience is there. They're going to see it at least once. Right. And my know. biggest, my frustration is the story's actually already written for you. And it's a phenomenal story. Yeah. Why the games are so big. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so just put that to screen in some sort of way. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, that's that's sad. Finn. <laughs> Uh, do you, Tom, do we have anything do you, else? To I'm good. Over? I'm set. I have to be done with it. I have to put it to rest. Ben, is there anything you'd like to add? No, Are we no. rolling credits? Here? I thought this was a solid week for everything but what was in theaters. So uh, <laughs> it's true. I, g- give Mass a watch. Give In Full Bloom a watch, and uh, and we'll call it and Broadway there. Melody at a seventy-one. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, very good. Okay, so Vin, we thank you for watching those movies. We thank you for stopping by this week. And folks, we're just going to run it down here one more time. We have Broadway Melody of 1940 with a seventy-one percent. We have In Full Bloom. Bloom with an 80, Mass with a 77, The Cursed with a 61, and Uncharted with a 45%. We thank you so much for listening. We thank you, one producer, for producing this episode, and we'll see you next week on the Daily Ratings Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, if you would, give us a good rating or tell a friend about us. If you're wondering if a film is worth a watch or if you'd just like to see more movie ratings from Vince, be sure to stop by the dailyratings.com where we have our ever-expanding catalog of films. Also, if you found value in the podcast or our site, become a producer and go to the donations tab on the dailyratings.com. You can donate whatever, whatever amount of value you feel you received from us. You'll get a producer mention on the next podcast episode, too. We're looking to build this into something large and great, but also be independent from those corporate sponsors. So we greatly appreciate any support from you all. So thanks so much, and we'll see you next time on the Daily Ratings Podcast.